Good evening. There are certain irony, ironies in politics. Take, for instance, Senator Keith Davies. He's written a book called The Rainmaker. And every time he turns another page, it would seem, he's taking a knife and sticking it into the back of John Turner. And that was part of my topic with John Turner when I interviewed him today. That and more, and here's Steve with the rundown on tonight's program. Man in Motion. Vancouver's Rick Hansen arrives triumphantly in the Maritimes. On Sunday, he begins the toughest part of his worldwide journey as he heads for home. Tonight, he speaks to Webster from Halifax. Also tonight, a co-op fails. 45,000 members lose their savings, but the provincial government refuses to investigate. Tonight, Elma Magali finds out why from the minister in charge. And liberal leader John Turner. Why is his chief campaign strategist saying all those nasty things about him? Tonight, he tells Webster that his leadership is safe. Mr. Turner, we're probably agreed that after two years, Mulroney's made so many botch-ups that he could be beaten, right? Well, I think uh, our Liberal Party's in, in shape that we, we continue to do some good hard work, Jack. We but is it, it not also a fact that after two years, your leadership is under such sharp attack that you don't know whether or not you're going to make it at the review in November? I'm very confident, Jack, that uh, after having traveled, traveled this country the way I have, that I'm in very good shape. It's not unanimous. There are people out there taking the odd shot at me. Let's but, just uh, take, let's take your problems one at a time. Right. Who did the secret Gallup poll which says, Cretian's the mad man we want, dump Turner? Well, we don't know, and neither does the Globe and Mail. And um, Hugh Windsor of the Globe and Mail is still trying to find out. But you know from within the Liberal Party, I'm sure somebody's giving you an idea who it, financed that Gallup poll. It might have been, um, might have been a liberal or might have been a conservative. They, Is, was that not a shattering blow to your uh, prestige and conceit? I, I don't think so, Jack. Uh, I don't talk much about polls, as you know, but at the moment, on the latest poll, we're running 12 points ahead of the conservatives. And anybody who says, I'm going to vote liberal, or I'm going to vote conservative, has already factored in John Turner and, and Brian Mulroney. Those well, are the polls that count. Let's talk about one of your better friends, the man whom you called in to rescue you when your campaign was floundering after you won the leadership. About whom am I speaking, Mr. Turner? You're talking about the pinch hitter, Keith Davy. All right. And what has Mr. Davy said recently? Well, Davy um, is trying to sell a book, I guess. He's not being too helpful, but... Uh, Are you suggesting that because Davy's got a, a chintzy book in the market, he's prepared to ruin you and the Liberal Party uh, to sell a few copies? To tell you the truth, uh, and I hope Keith and I will get together pretty soon, I really don't know what's on his mind. Because if there's one thing that I remember Keith Davy for, and I like him for, We've worked together since 1960, 1962. His number one rule, loyalty to the party, loyalty to the leader. Except this time around. Well, I, I really don't know what he has in mind, it's, uh, but it's one man's point of view. Well, can I tell you what he has in mind? You tell me. He wants to you to be replaced as leader of the Liberal Party. By whom? Cretien? Don Johnson? Well, I'm I... not asking you to pick successors, but surely you must agree that Davy's behavior now is such as to cause you great concern. I, uh, I'm surprised, and, and obviously my, my colleagues uh, in the House of Commons and the Senate and the party right across the country are not happy because Keith Davy's not only taking me on, if that's what he wants to do, he's taking on the Liberal Party. Do you want to tell him right now if he keeps this up, he could smash the Liberal Party? No, I think... Uh, Influential as Keith has been, uh, I can tell you that uh, knowing the Liberal Party better than anybody these days, Jack, um, people are considering it as one man's point of view. It's a free party. It's a free country. Uh, just on the, on the convention itself, of course, you wouldn't do the Joe Clark thing. If you get 50 plus one, that's good enough, isn't it? There's no magic number, Jack, but I'll tell you, and I've said to you before on, on this program, I thought Joe was foolish. 66 and uh, two-thirds is what he got, and that's a two-to-one majority, and that's good enough for anybody. I want to give you the latest uh, shaft, which is on page <laughs> one of the Globe and Mail today. Liberal leader John Turner backed away from an attack on the Star Wars program <clears throat> after being advised to do so by, his, by U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz. This story, according to Davy, this is Davy again, you were supposed to announce a complete rejection of Canadian involvement. You had... You checked first with John Schultz, according to Davy, and then when you come back, you drop the whole thing immediately. Is that true that, or false? That, that's not my recollection. I'm a good friend of George Schultz's. 
As a matter of fact, uh, Jill and I were among those who attended his 65th birthday some, some months ago. Mm -hmm. Our party is against Star Wars, Star Wars. Despite my friendship for, for George Schultz, our party has taken a strong position on free trade, mm -hmm. despite, despite my uh, friendship for George Schultz. So uh, my rec uh, recollection doesn't quite uh, mm -hmm. coincide with, uh, with the senators. You must remember that I'm a reporter in the West, and much of the scuttlebutt which goes across the country comes out of the East, right? I'm a member of Parliament from the West, too, Jack, so I know what you're talking about. Well, do you know exactly what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah. Because there does seem to be a concentrated campaign to get Turner. I don't believe there is. I believe there are some isolated voices. Uh, I never expected unanimity. I can assure you, when you come down to that convention in, in uh, November, and I hope you do, there will be substantial support for John Turner, the member of parliament for Quadrant. Great big article in the Globe the other day saying, Turner's staff is quitting in droves. It mentions John Swift. It mentions, um, who's the other guy? Ross Fitzpatrick. No, Ross is still with us. Uh, uh, John. Uh, Gave me two and a half years of his life. Uh, it was in his game plan to return to the practice of law in Vancouver. Nothing unusual about that. Just the usual natural turnover in staff. I, uh... Money. Five million in debt, the party is. Maybe under this question of uh, confidence in Davy and company, and of course, Cretien standing on the <laughs> sidelines grinning like the Cheshire cat, isn't he? Uh, John Cretien says he's practicing law, but let's talk about the money. Yeah, the money, part five million in debt. When we were, well, we were about three and a half million in debt after the election, three and a half to four million. You can imagine after taking the, the biggest defeat in Canadian history uh, in 1984 that that wasn't a great year to raise money, nor was 1985. We're now back in equilibrium. We're raising as much as we spend. For the first time in the history of the Liberal Party, we have coordination between who spends and who raises money. That debt will be down below three million by the end of the year. And hopefully, as Iona and I have uh, said publicly, we'll liquidate it by next year. Give me one last word for those in the West who are, in, if they're liberals, who are infected by the Keith Davy campaign against you. What would you, what do you say to liberals specifically about Davy's attacks on you? Because his, his attacks have been devastating. I, uh, I think Western liberals understand that under my leadership, there's going to be a new style of party, young liberals particularly. And that Western, Westerners now know that uh, I meant what I said, that new policy will include Western prerogatives. I've spent more time in Western Canada, particularly in British Columbia, than any leader of any national party since John George Diefenbaker, whose, whose monument we put up yesterday at Parliament Hill. So I think Western liberals will look at this particular incident of Senator Davey with a particular point of view. Which would be what? Which would be, it's a new party. And uh, we like the way it's going. And have no truck, no trade with Davy. I didn't say that, but... Uh, Gosh, you... You know, you know a lot of the liberals out here, Jack. Uh, you talk to them. You ask them. John Turner, leader of the Liberal Party. Next, we'll get down to some political issues after the break. <laughs> Mr. Turner, I interviewed our... Um, Prime Minister the other day, and he laid the entire and total blame on you and your rat pack for the disappearance of Bosley. He denied there were any leaks from the PMO. He said it was entirely your fault every which way. How dare you hound a distinguished speaker out of the House of Commons? You know, when the speaker was under pressure, publicly, I emerged from our caucus and said he had our unanimous support. It may be that some of our members had got into trouble with him. So did Mr. Broadbent. But we said the speaker's the speaker, just like a referee in a hockey game. Well, how, how, how did Moroni shaft him? If you believe Moroni shafted him, how did he do it? Uh, his ministers were talking to Bosley. His henchmen, his uh, backroom boys in the office were after Bosley. And when I went down to see Bosley, because Bosley called me and said, John, I'm going to submit my letter to the clerk. I'm resigning. I said, hold on, Mr. Speaker. I'll be right down. And for three quarters of an hour, I tried to talk to him and say, look, you'll damage yourself. You'll damage the independence of the chair of the institution of parliament. Don't do it. You can stand up to the prime minister. No prime minister would dare to bring a vote into the House of Commons to remove the speaker. I said, we kill him. I said, but, uh, Broadbent and I would mount an attack like you've never heard since the pipeline debate. But I can tell you that the speaker was under that pressure 
and he felt he could no longer discharge his duties. But now we have a situation whereby they're going to elect a new <clears throat> speaker, and nominations more or less from the floor. Is that correct? No nominations from the floor. Well, nominations. No, no, anybody no. who wants to be speaker can submit their name. Anybody who wants to be speaker, except a minister or a leader of a party, or who hasn't filed a declaration with the clerk that he doesn't want to stand or she doesn't want to stand, is eligible. And under the new rules, uh, the way those rules are spelled out, it could go on for days. It'd be like waiting for the election of a pope and you'll well, see I some white smoke up the peace tower. I had the silly story the other day about a great number of the 39 liberals going to put their names in for speaker just to confuse the issue. No, no. Have you banned that? No, no, that was never the case. I said only that I would not ask any of my members not to stand. It was up to them. And uh, they're not all, go all going to run. I think what's going to happen and we're keeping our ears pretty close to the corridors of Parliament. I think Mulroney, the Prime Minister, is going to give, it, give everyone the word on his side as to who he or she should be. Well, doesn't he have to do that? Well... The guy's got to be bilingual. Well, under the new rules, it's supposed to be a free election, secret ballot, and, of course, we're going to be very careful to watch as to whether there's any influence by the Prime Minister on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what about Camp? I asked uh, Mr. Camp, Mr. Mulroney, about what the duties were of this old tired party <coughs> hack at $100,000 a year or more, and he denied that he is the top civil servant, that Tellier has to report through Camp. Would you agree with the Prime Minister's interpretation of the appointment? Well, you know, Dalton Camp, uh, I mentioned Mr. Diefenbaker's uh, statue yesterday. We were very sorry that Dalton Camp wasn't invited to that particularly. Why wouldn't he be invited? Well, you know, uh, the man who did the Deef, the man who did the Chief in, at any rate, Dalton Camp has a $100,000 plus salary with the rank of a deputy minister sitting, as we understand it, at the cabinet table with direct access to the ear of the prime minister. Is that improper? Uh, if I were the secretary of the cabinet, I wouldn't like it. If I were the secretary to the private secretary to the prime minister, I wouldn't like it. This is a politician sitting right in on the inner councils of government and being paid as if he were a civil servant. I think it's politicizing the public service of Canada. Let's get down to the big business. Prime Minister Mulroney said in Brandon the other day that the, the climate has been poisoned and it's fearful of free trade. Whose fault is it? Who poisoned the climate? The Americans with their protectionism and their, their, their elections coming up in a couple of weeks? Well, I think the, uh, the whole free trade negotiation has been botched, bungled by Mr. Mulroney and his team. I think, uh, as I've said publicly, we've been a bunch of patsies with the Americans. Every time they, they push us, we yield. We yielded on softwood lumber. We uh, almost admitted that they had a valid case. Uh, we're threatening to yield on steel. I just think that the uh, uh, Prime Minister has allowed the Americans to come in with these unilateral attacks on us when we're supposed to be sitting down having negotiations towards freer trade. I think uh, the whole thing has been pathetic. Let's talk about softwood lumber. I got the impression that it was uh, Van der Zam who blew the whistle and damaged the negotiating point by saying we're prepared to have a stumpage review. Well, I, uh, I called the Premier uh, and uh, said to him, Mrs. Carney has uh, put us in a very bad position here because we won the case on softwood lumber in 1983. The times have changed. Well, the law hasn't changed and the facts have not changed. And if we hold to our case, we can flush the Americans right out in the open. But if you admit their case to begin with, then you're dead. But surely, they, if we won the case, they'd bring in some form of legislation under the regulatory process and still nail us. Jack, we earned free trade and lumber with the United States after the Tokyo round of trade discussions. Canada had to give way on telecommunication equipment and other American stuff coming into Canada, which now comes in with a lower free duty. We earned that access into the American market. And the Americans love talking about the level playing field, but whenever you start to win on their field, they change the lines and they change the rules and they even change the referee. All right, if we get the countervail and it looks like we might, what would you as Prime Minister do? Break off the whole of the free trade talks? I would do what Premier Bennett suggested, and I agreed with him when this issue first arose. If the Americans are going to continue to shoot across our bow with this unilateral type of harassment, I'd say either give us a standstill agreement where we're going to have none of these actions on either side of the border until we finish our negotiations, or, boy, we're going to have to look at these negotiations again very seriously. You mean a veiled threat to stop all negotiations? Well, it doesn't make any sense that if the government of Canada is negotiating with the Americans moving towards free trade, 
that the Americans hit us in one area where we already have free trade. But it does make sense because Packwood in the West and the lumber industry in the Northeast and our increasing share of the market, they're being hurt by us. Jack. Surely we've got to give something to them. Here the president knuckled under to Packwood in Oregon and to the senators from Idaho and Montana on softwood lumber, affecting British Columbia particularly, but the whole of the country. Now we have Senator Hines from Pennsylvania starting to say, hey, if they can knuckle the president, I'm going to do it on steel. There's too much uh, Canadian steel coming in to the American market. So he's got a resolution before the Congress. Then you're going to have the senators from Michigan coming after us on the auto pack. Once you get soft in this kind of negotiation with a Yankee trader, you're dead. Now, what you and Trudeau would have adopted the, what I told Maroney was arrogant disdain and keep them at arm's length. Not arrogant disdain. But, uh, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd have some pride in our sovereignty and pride in our own bargaining position, and we'd stand up for Canada a little better than our government is standing up for us the, right now. I know that the countervail would be a body blow to British Columbia and could cost us 3,000 jobs and maybe even more. But what have the Americans done to the prairie farmers? Our farmer, not only in the prairies, but particularly in the prairies, but right across the country, is in very dangerous trouble. The family farm is at risk. We're caught in a trade war. With, with the Americans. With the Americans and the Europeans. But the Americans have gone two steps further. That U.S. farm bill is killing the American farmer. Those prices on grains are at the lowest in constant dollars since the Depression. And now our friends, the Americans, are subsidizing the Soviet Union, our largest customer in wheat, to try to take away our biggest market. Now, that is not a friendly act. And the only thing that we can do, presumably, is subsidize Canadian farmers with more subsidy payments. Well, the American farmer is getting subsidized about $6 a bushel. Our farmer is getting subsidized about two fifty dollars or two sixty dollars a bushel. Are we going to be able to compete with the American Treasury and the European Treasuries? We've called for an international grain conference to try to get some stabilization and some reason into the market. We've called for grain on the agenda of the GATT negotiations now down in Uruguay. We've called for the Prime Minister to go see the President and say, look, you're killing us. Here we've got free trade negotiations with you, and the Canadian farmer is getting it right in the neck because of your U.S. farm bill. Well, when he talks about poison political climates, maybe that Reagan won't talk to him again. Well, you know, uh, I once said uh, just recently that our Prime Minister uh, jumps on every bandwagon that goes by, and the recent one, of course, is, is drugs. I think he's got great admiration for the President, and... Uh, Gosh knows what their relationship is now. Drugs? Drugs? You mean when he got kind of caught in the middle? Are you in favor, Mr. Turner, of mandatory testing of uh, drug users in certain circumstances? I am not in favor of mandatory drug testing. I think it's an invasion of privacy. I think it's the beginning of the police state. Uh, and uh, that's where I stand, quite clearly. And I'll be glad to see the editorial board of the Vancouver Sun any time on that particular issue. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's a private joke. <laughs> now, back to a couple of other things. Um, when I was interviewing the Prime Minister, he told me that the figure the media uses of $150 million spent in Manicouag in his own writing was false. Did you make a count on what the Prime Minister spent in his own writing? Because out here, we're kind of jealous of that kind of the, largesse. Uh, the latest calculations we have, and... Um, is somewhere in the neighborhood of $168 million. Now, uh, uh, that's not only uh, causing problems for the Prime Minister in Western Canada, because it um, compares favorably with the whole uh, province of British Columbia and what uh, we've managed to get here from our Prime Minister. Uh, the Premier of Manitoba complained that Manicouagan was getting twice what the whole province of Manitoba was getting. But uh, be, as, be it as it, it may, Manicouagan, there's a lot of unemployment up there. Uh, and the people uh, of Manicouagan need some help, but uh, surely the Prime Minister, in meeting a policy of regional equality, ought to be a little more fair-minded about it. Did that include the $68 million for moving the prison? Uh, well, the, the, don't we know. Uh, uh, the figures we have, Jack, is that by moving the prison to Port Cartier, it is costing the Canadian taxpayer about $18 million more than it would have otherwise, and the annual costs to keep the prison way out there will be $3 million more than it otherwise would have cost. But what's really uh, just as important, it's going to be difficult to get experts up there. And for families who want to visit prisoners, after all, this is part of any rehabilitation program, Drummondville, where it should have been uh, placed, was far more convenient. Drummondville is halfway between Montreal and Quebec City. 
uh, Fort Cartier is a long way away. Well, John Turner, you're under very heavy attack. You may not survive it. You may well be thrown out the, the leadership review in November if the Eastern Power and the Liberal Party keep attacking you. Is that not a possibility? It's very remote, Jack, and I hope you come down because uh, I tell you and your colleagues and the media right across the country, sure, you want a, want a, you want a media event out of this. You, no, but no, I, we don't. You want no, a media no, no, event out of it. That's not true. But I want to tell you, I think I understand the party better than I did two years ago. That is for sure. But better than any other living Canadian. It's not unanimous. But my support is substantial. But isn't that appalling that Davies out to cut your throat? It's not helpful, but it's one man's point of view. No way you can cut his? <laughs> I'll be seeing Keith Davy in due course. Thanks, John Turner. I'll be back after the break. Thanks, Jack. And so will we, as a matter of fact, when uh, Davy comes out to flog his book. That should be a fascinating interview, that one. However, right, I'm going to take a section of telephone calls now. What do you think of Turner? Do you think he's doing, if you're a liberal or if you're not a liberal, a good job, or should he be dumped as Davy Wright? Your comments after the break. I'd rather have a ton of live in the studio, same with Mulroney, but when you can't do that, I still want to get some reaction from you. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello? That's yes, you. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Jack, yes, I'm a, a Western Canadian, uh -huh. a, a French Canadian, born in Western Canada, and I would certainly like to see Jean Chrétien as the leader of the Liberal Party, and I'm wondering what we, who would you prefer to have? I am totally objective, nonpartisan, sitting in the middle. My job merely is to provoke people, but uh, you don't like Turner, right? Well, I think that Jean Chrétien, as a Westerner, appeals to me much better. He, he's got that quality, he's got the, he's just the heart, enough. and he's also, you know, he's... Fair enough, but he won't tell me why he doesn't like Turner. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. Hello there. Jack, I would like to see uh, John Turner stay on as leader because uh, he hasn't got a hope in uh, winning against the Conservatives. Uh, and Chrétien does, I think. So I, uh, I want to see Turner stay. And oh, I'll oh, never oh. forgive you for bumping WKRP off the air. Did I bump WKRP off the air? I don't know. Well, I take up as much room, I'm sure. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, it's such a relief to see a man of integrity in a, in a major position uh, like John Turner. And, and uh, furthermore, I really, really am relieved to see a man in his position call a spade a spade on this drug testing issue. It is an invasion of privacy. It's the first step towards a fascist state. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, please. Hello. Oh, that's you? Yes, well, with respect to John Turner being a man of integrity, uh, well, let's just say that I find that interesting. As far as him being the, the leader of the Liberal Party, he has absolutely no presence, and I think the only reason that he won the convention was that he came out of a kind of a, a the mystique of his uh, separation from the Liberal Party, and they, they voted him back in. But uh, really, uh, Jean Chrétien should be, should be the leader of the party, and I, and I have no doubt that that is exactly what will happen at the next convention. Thank you. wonder if he was a Liberal. Go ahead, please. Hi, Jack. Apropos of the last call, I think uh, yes. Turner was just not brought because he came out from the call, but Turner is quite right in saying that he knows the party better than anybody else. And in his interview with you, I thought he came out far more honest and forthright than Maroney did. Thank you. That's another Turner supporter. So go ahead, please. Hello? Yep. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, uh, John Turner is no leader for the country. Uh, Mulroney is obviously a failure. So why don't we give Chrétien a chance? Uh, you know, maybe he'll stop feather betting the East and uh, award us the ship contracts that we should have got a long time ago. And, Maybe take care of the West Coast for a change. Well, with the best will in the world, I would think that a Quebec politician would concentrate most of his efforts in Quebec. Yeah, but I think Chrétien's broad-minded enough to realize that we also are part of Canada, and he might do some good for us, too, because obviously, uh, you know, I'm getting a little, I'm 33 years old, and I'm sure getting fed up with voting for the Liberals and the Conservatives uh, and having leaders like Turner, who, I mean, the, the man can't even talk properly on television, and he's just a complete failure. Mulroney, all this he's done is just feather bed his own nest, and uh, we all know that. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Go, go, sorry. go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. I'd like to uh, first just disagree with the last caller. I think Mr. Turner has uh, done 
very well on television with your questions, and I think he's improved quite a bit over the last couple of years since he's been in the leadership, and uh, I wish him well in the leadership convention coming up. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, I think that if you watch John Turner, he has done uh, a heck of a job improving his uh, mannerisms and his approach to uh, the media. I think he's uh, rebuilt the party. He's done one hell of a job rebuilding that party. And a matter of fact, uh, I think I want to support him during the next election, and I do believe the Liberals are going to take it in the next election, and Mr. Mulroney is all just uh, just fanfare. Maybe I should have asked people what they thought of Keith Davey. Well, Keith Davey has no business doing what he's doing if he wants to be a true Liberal. He's just destroying the party from the inside, and uh, people like that, they, they don't really require that. Furthermore, he's safe and secure for life now in the Senate, isn't he? So he doesn't care what he says or does, does he? And he's got a book to sell. You bet, and I won't buy it. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack, I've been trying to get through to you. I think that John's doing a very good job. And one other thing I'd like to say is that all these pe people who are pushing for Chrétien to get up front, and they're saying because he is a French-Canadian, and that is just what's driving everybody else up the wall. If he was a Canadian first of French extraction second, Maybe we'd get somewhere. For the last 20 years, we've been mostly governed by Pierre Elliott Trudeau, now Mulroney, who are both French Canadians instead of Canadians of French extraction. The day these French Canadians come out, there are all sorts of them out here, real good people. But they'll tell you first off, they are Canadians first and French second. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. I just wanted to say that as a former card carrying member of the Conservative Party, I certainly am going to support John Turner. And with people like Davies, I don't think he, uh, what is it they say, that friends, uh, with friends like that, you don't need any enemies. Mm -hmm. And I think that the only thing I would like to see is the, is the uh, abol abolition of the Senate. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, please. Yes, I think that Jean Chrétien, in whatever portfolio he has been in, he has demonstrated great evidence of, of the kind of support he has for the West. He's a great Westerner and, and a French-Canadian second. Well, you're kind of delicately anti turner right? Yes, I am. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Oh, it didn't work. Go ahead, please. That's you. Yeah, hi, Jack. Uh, I was just kind of wondering what happened to all the uh, politicians with charisma. I don't think we have any left here in Canada. Well, Mulroney had charisma. Had charisma, didn't he? I don't know. Did he? Oh, he had charm. Some people said it was smarm and charm. <laughs> but he certainly is a very appealing individual to talk to and to interview. Hasn't done too well in the past two years, but we don't have anyone with charisma in the province of British Columbia except Premier Van der Zam, who e exudes charisma. That's right, he does. Thank you very much. Charisma ain't necessarily a good thing by which to judge a politician. Go ahead, please. Yes, um, I'm 100% behind John Turner. He's the reason that I went back to voting in the last election. And quite frankly, I'm tired of French Canadian prime ministers, and the last thing I want is another French-Canadian Prime Minister for a few years. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, please. I think that uh, Turner uh, should stay on. He uh, had a lot of catching up to do coming back into politics, and I think also concerning Keith Davies' current remarks that uh, any remarks he make will help Turner. Thank you. From Powell River. Yes, uh, Jack. Uh, I think that the Liberal Party should jump dump John Turner because every time every time when he gets on make a speech he just goes simply wild okay and as well as he just he's just a bumbling twit you know oh I hardly think he's a bumbling twit you know I've been known to say some sharp things myself but I don't like to call a guy who dedicates his life to the country you know a bumbling twit he isn't a bumbling twit go ahead please Jack. Yes. There's a group of us sitting here watching your program tonight, and we've taken a little poll on our own, and three out of four go for John Turner. All the way. But you're all over 50. <laughs> you're <laughs> all you over tell? 50. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, please. Hi. Hi. I'd just like to say, uh, personally, John Turner's a, uh, uh, a good leader, mm -hmm. and I think that he's more capable of running the country than Brian Mulroney is, and at least he tries to... Uh, take care of some of the issues that are at stake and doesn't try to dodge everything like Mulroney does. And um, if I was at the Leadership Review, I'd support him. Well, why don't you go? You're not a member. Well, I am now. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. Yes. Yes, I'd like to say that I'm an NDP member. Uh-huh. And you've got one member here of the NDP party that'll go liberal. 
because of the fact that Turner is not afraid of those Americans, and at least he'll stand up for B.C., and that's what we need. He was very forthright on that subject tonight. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes. Uh, sorry, Jack, I could never vote for another liberal after uh, what they did to the uh, Alberta and, and, and the West. And Mulroney is a major, major disappointment for, for uh, conservative people. Um, I, I want to bring up again the subject of a, uh, an equal elected Senate. Well, uh, that's going to come one of these days, but it won't be done by the Tories this time round. But until we get an elected Senate, the West is going to be denied and neglected in many ways on its fair share of the pie. Yes. If Thank we you. We'll leave that for the moment. And uh, now we're going to meet the man in motion after the break. Rick, it's not often I'm at a loss for words, but I don't know how to describe the admiration I and uh, perhaps everybody in the world has for you and your magnificent feet on which you're now tackling the heaviest part. Tell me, Rick, compared to when you left Vancouver, how do you feel physically today? Well, I've got to say that uh, I've uh, been through a few wars, and uh, I know I've uh, paid the price in a lot of ways. Uh, I've got a lot of injuries uh, that are ongoing, and uh, we're pretty tired right now. It's been a real hectic pace, uh, especially here in Canada. But, you know, we can smell the barn, so we're not that far away. It's uh, only another 6,000 miles to go. It's uh, 6,000 odd miles to the barn. <laughs> and you, when will you be here, God willing? It looks like uh, we'll be there in early spring, uh, hopefully April if all goes well and uh, I stay healthy. And uh, the winter and Mother Nature are, are very kind to us. Well, now, just tell me something. Did you really think when you started out, God knows, goodness knows how long ago, and you've covered what, 18,000 odd, mi odd miles, that you could make it back to Canada? Yeah, I really did. I, I truly believed in it. But uh, if you had asked me that question about two or three days after I left, I might have had a different story for you because uh, I was injured by that time uh, because of the severe weather conditions. And uh, literally, uh, I was scared uh, we were in trouble. But uh, somehow we managed to make it out of the hole uh, not only once but a number of times along this tour. But there was a time when your health was really giving you, your muscles were giving you a very bad problem. Where was that? that uh, the, the, the injury started uh, the second day uh, out into the tour, and uh, they were continual uh, from that in one way or another. It wasn't until we hit Europe where not only the injuries, but also my health uh, started to give me problems. I had carbon monoxide poisoning. I had the flu. And also, uh, a month or two later, I ran into some problems, some serious problems with my stomach as a result of uh, the change in diet and the water. Was, was that in China? Uh, no, actually, the, uh, the, uh, all those problems were throughout our entire journey in, in Europe. That was from July right through until December. Uh, once we entered China, uh, we had uh, severe problems with the winds, and uh, it just aggravated, continually aggravated my left shoulder, and uh, it created, again, another problem. Listen, how many times to, re to relieve your muscles do you have to twiddle your wheelchair around and go backwards? Well, uh, there was a time when uh, I had to wheel backwards. I was wheeling uh, as much as 5 to 10 miles a day backwards, trying to relieve some of the strain off the injured areas. And, uh, you know, one of the keys to success on this project has been the, uh, the ability to adapt. You know what happened to the dinosaur when they ran into problems? Uh, they, they just ceased to exist in this tour. Uh, would have been in the same position had we not learned to adapt uh, because what's good today uh, is not going to be good tomorrow and uh, we have to keep finding out uh, new answers uh, to, the, to new problems. Is there one particular section of the journey anywhere, whether it was in the Australian desert or in the Alps or when you're named a hero of hero by the Chinese, which stands out as really something shining in your mind, where everything went well and where you were as happy as could be in these incredibly exhausting circumstances. Well, I think that the, the most unbelievable response of the entire tour until uh, up till the time we reached Canada was our journey through China, traveling from Beijing to Shanghai. And it wasn't so much being called a hero or anything like that, but it was, it was the fact that we really, truly, finally impacted an entire country from the central government right to the peasants in the fields. And uh, I think they really got the message uh, of our project that related to awareness about the potential of disabled persons. And well, what, what I kind of feel about it, my own gut feeling, is that it wouldn't have mattered if you hadn't raised a, raised a nickel anywhere because of the fact you've demonstrated this in 
incredible capacity for a man in your condition to do the unbelievable. Well, that's the most important part of this project, and I keep stating it time and time again. Uh, the number one priority is to create awareness about the potential of disabled persons all over the world. That's why we've gone to countries like the Soviet Union, Poland, uh, China. Uh, we're not interested in raising funds there. You can't, uh, you can't buy the, the kind of exposure that this tour has created for billions of dollars. And uh, that's been the, the main focus and will continue to be the main focus until we reach home to Vancouver. In fact, the inspiration you've given to individual people in the same or similar or parallel circumstances what, what was your choice before you started this Man in Motion magnificent concept? What was really the choice for you as an individual? Well, the choice for me was to continue on in the peak of my athletic career uh, as three-time world champion uh, in wheelchair marathoning, and uh, I had a bright future ahead of me uh, in physical education as an instructor. And uh, you know, I could have continued on to uh, to do the best I could in that area, but. Uh, the door opened once for me to, to, uh, to have my opportunity to contribute to mankind uh, in a really uh, substantial way and, uh, and I had to take it and I dropped everything. Uh, I, I left everything, I have nothing to come back to, uh, but that doesn't matter because it, uh, you know, it, it really had to happen then and now and, uh, and I'm really glad that we've done it. Tell me about your staff, tell me about Amanda, could you have done it without Amanda? <laughs> I, 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 there's no way I could have. Uh, I mean, not, not only Amanda, but uh, the entire crew have been, uh, they've been behind me 100%. Uh, they're the unsung heroes of this project. You know, very few people uh, really realize that uh, we've got Amanda, Mike, Don, uh, Nancy, and Simon out here, and uh, they've left their friends and families back home, their jobs, and uh, they're behind me 100%. They're working uh, extremely long hours to help me help others. Well, we're all looking forward to, I mean, we know it's been a very expensive trip and you've raised and defrayed all the costs and all of that. And we know that half a million was raised even in China of all places. And now it's up to Canadians to support you on the Canadian Trust Fund, isn't it? Uh, that's right. You know, uh, Canada has been really the only country that we've targeted and have known that we're going to raise substantial funds uh, for our trust fund. Uh, you know, up, to, up till now, uh, we've had a great response, and uh, we've seen the fact that Canadians are responding. Newfoundlanders, I mean, many of the communities we traveled through, people were donating the equivalent of a dollar per person uh, yeah. in times when it's uh, economically difficult, there's large unemployment. But uh, people believe in the project, and it is happening here in Canada. But I'll tell you one thing, uh, regardless uh, of what happens uh, in, in the fundraising department, uh, we've definitely had our impact, and uh, we'll, we'll continue to keep going. The bottom line is, Jack, when we, when we get home, if we, raise, if we raise our objective, this project won't be all that expensive. It'll be about 10% in terms of a fundraising endeavor, and that's a... Uh, oh, I don't think anybody's worrying about that. The very trip itself without raising money was such a magnificent feat for other people to be inspired by. Well, now, a couple of basic questions. You start off coast to coast. When do you leave Halifax Sunday? We leave Halifax Sunday. We head north. Uh, to Turo and then into Prince Edward Island for three days of wheeling. From there, we're into New Brunswick, and uh, then it's uh, across Quebec and into Ontario, approximately the end of October, and uh, then it's the long trek uh, westward back to uh, British Columbia. That's going to be worse than the Alps, isn't There's it? No doubt about it. The, the difficulty we're going to encounter in going across Canada in the wintertime uh, is going to be um, the biggest challenge we've ever had in our lives. Um, the winter... I've got, uh, it, uh, Rick, I've got a really silly question for you. Are you going to have to get special snow tires for your wheelchair? We, <laughs> we have uh, special snow tires. We even have a special wheelchair that's being built. It's uh, going to be four-wheel drive. In other words, uh, when I push on the rear wheels, there will be a chain that drives the front wheels as well for added traction in the icy and snowy conditions. Uh, will that be the first time you will have used this kind of wheelchair? That's right. It's been tested out uh, by uh, a good friend of mine, and it's been built down in Florida. And uh, it'll, it'll have had about two or three dry runs, but uh, it'll be the first time I've tried it. We know it'll allow me to keep going in those kind of conditions. We even have studs and, uh, and chains if we need them. But nevertheless, uh, somehow we'll find a way to get, uh, to get through the winter. It may bring our uh, pace back down uh, below the 50-mile limit because of the, uh, the actual... Uh, difficulty in pushing the four-wheel drive machine and also because we don't know how many hours yet I'll be allowed to or be able to get out into the sub-zero temperatures. 
How many hours? You can't do more than two or three hours a day in that kind of way. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going for the max, and I'd like, you know, this is a full commitment, and I'm trying my best uh, to get out there and get in a full day. That means uh, eight or nine hours uh, out, out in, the, uh, in the environment. And uh, we've got some specialized clothing that's being developed up at SFU uh, with a lot of people working together. Uh, this clothing is uh, very uh, high tech, it's uh, lightweight, uh, very insulated, and it allow me the freedom to keep pushing and stay warm uh, in those difficult conditions. One of the problems. And the little heater in the wheelchair? <laughs> we may even have one, that's right. Uh, one of the problems I have is with my disability, I can't feel my feet. Uh, I won't know whether it's getting too cold and I could, uh -oh. I could get uh, frostbite. But uh, what we've done to, to counter that is we've uh, developed a skin sensor um, apparatus where I put it on my feet and uh, it, on a console it gives us a constant temperature readout of, of my feet, my toes, and if it gets down too cold then we can take a break, make some changes and get back out again. In other words, the sensor will tell you whether you're in danger of being frostbitten. That's exactly right. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the variables and the difficulties. We're, we're not afraid of winter, but we respect it. And uh, we'll do the best we can to get rid of the uh, difficulties, minimize them, and, uh, and keep pressing but on. Just of that, what reminds me that we respect you with unlimited ad admiration. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You know, see you in Vancouver. I'll see you in Ottawa at the big roast for Crosby, and then I'll see you in Vancouver. A million thanks, Rick. And thank you. Best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll be back after the break. With me now is Alma Magali from Castlegar. And Alma, if she has a couple of things, has perspicacity, stubbornness, a sense of injustice, and she still can't get the questions answered the way she wants them answered by the government. Alma, of course, was one of the investors in the Teachers Investment and Housing Co-op, which went insolvent some little time back, short about $78 million. Now, you were not covered by deposit insurance. We don't have to go over that caper again, do we? No, that's true, unfortunately. That's and even true. though the depositors in the banks that went belly up got 100 cents on the dollar when they were depositors, you didn't get that and you're not expecting it now, are you? No, we presently have a GIC for 46 cents. We will uh, recoup some portion of a further 20 cents on the dollar, uh, quite unknown. And uh, with the real estate prices in Alberta the way they are, likely to be a way less. Right. So therefore, of the $250 million when you were insolvent, solvent, $78 million were deficient because of falling values. And you now hold for each dollar a guaranteed income certificate for 46 cents with the prospects of another 20. So you might get 65 cents on the dollar. We're also given three cents in shares uh, of Trusco, which is not listed yet. So and of course, I, I, I should make it quite clear that the Teachers Housing Investment Co-op uh, has gone through certain stages and is now virtually in the hands of the receiver. Is that correct? No, it's gone past that. Uh, they were, the Supreme Court of uh, uh, BC accepted uh, the uh, offer of CanWest. So no. it, it's no longer functioning. And that's one of the problems that uh, Mr. Veach sees with our petition. You went and saw Mr. Veach today, the uh, Consumer and Corporate Affairs Minister. What did you ask and what did, what did you, what do you want? What did you ask and what did you get? What we asked for was for him to reconsider his uh, dismissal of our uh, inquiry pe petition. Now, I'd like to tell you just briefly about that, how that came about. On March the 10th, we had a big meeting at Tupper School. Uh, over 800 people attended. We set out our program then, and we started there and then to collect the signatures and to do all the work to have an inquiry. Uh, of your 45,000 members, you had to get 10% of them to sign a petition before an inquiry was mandatory. Right, and our petition had 5,085 signatures on it, but that's another story. Uh, what we uh, took the precaution of doing and what we do feel badly about is that we ascertained from Mr. Mulholland, who is the superintendent of cooperatives, uh, what uh, conditions we would have to meet in order that our um, complaint, and that's the word the Act used, uh, be deemed uh, bona fide. And uh, we followed those quite scrupulously and carefully and, uh, with, and put a lot of effort into meeting that. And um, it, seems, it seems to us, and it still seems to us, that uh, the reasons for dismissal of our petition are not related to the criteria that were given to us. Now, you've got many thousands of members throughout the province, uh, many of them relying on their RRSPs, etc., right? That's very true. So what you want now, do, do you want somebody to make up the money or do you want an inquiry so you can find out how this came about 
in circumstances of which you were not aware? Well, you know very well that we did pursue uh, as energetically as we could uh, uh, obtaining a guarantee which, had it been granted when we asked for it, would have cost the taxpayers of this province nothing. But in the event that the, the uh, real estate and the different holdings and assets of the co-op became worth nothing, it would have cost each taxpayer $13 on a one-time basis. You anyway, explain, that's history. No, and, but you better uh, explain that a little more. When you, when you first w became insolvent, in which you were an investor and not a member, correct? You yourself. I wouldn't let anybody but you call me an investor. I was a depositor. A depositor and not a member. You asked the government for a guarantee to hold things steady for you if you give a chance to... For restructuring. Restructuring. And they wouldn't do that. Exactly. So that was the first letdown from the government in a major way. Right. And uh, we, at the same time, always did make known our intention to petition for an inquiry. And we uh, subsequently went through all the steps and all the work that I've said. And uh, then on uh, July the 8th, we presented it very publicly and with a lot of media coverage. We presented it to Mr. Veach. Um, on the Labor Day weekend, August the 9th to be exact, 15 minutes before I would have left the house to go camping for the weekend, I got Mr. Veach's answer, and I think that was de a deliberate timing. And, um, of course, we didn't get a lot of media coverage on the Labor Day weekend. Anyway, you, you went... So then uh, what happened was that we decided after we recovered from this stunning blow that uh, we would seek to have that decision reconsidered. And that's what we've been about, is having this decision reconsidered. And in, uh, our only friends in this whole struggle have been the media. Mm -hmm. And it was on the Dave Barrett show that, uh, a week Friday, that um, he was able to gain the minister's... Um, Approval for ap a meeting. Yes. Now, you and saw the minister today. We what saw the minister What did the minister today. say in answer to your questions? What you want is an inquiry under the Cooperative Act, right? Yes, and he says, and uh, it, he made it very clear that the government is adamant in this position, that they will not give us an inquiry because they say they do not have the authority to conduct such an inquiry, and they feel that the cost of such an inquiry, inquiry would not be justified. But why do they not have the authority? They can inquire into anything they want to. I'm sure under any act or under an order in the council or anything. But first, before about that, what is it you're looking for? The real estate value has collapsed. The investments may not have been properly guided in terms of sound business practice at that time. What are you hoping to find out from a provincial inquiry? Well, we're, we're still feeling very much like the injured, innocent bystander, as David Baines called us in the province. We really feel that deeply within ourselves. We did get something today which does meet one of our objectives because we know how rotten it feels to have this happen to you and how much hardship it has caused so many people. We know it well. And uh, we are pleased because we have always said from the beginning it is a justice issue and knowing how this feels, we do not wish it ever to happen to anybody else, even this government. So you want an inquiry into the circumstances by which the Teachers Housing and Investment Co-op became insolvent. That's right, exactly. And we did have three positive results from the meeting today. And one of them is that the minister will consider, now I hope everybody's listening carefully when I say will consider, uh, a, a petition from us asking for an inquiry by the superintendent of co-ops. Mm -hmm. There is no guarantee we'll get that or no promise, but mm -hmm. he will consider it and we certainly are applying immediately because we feel any inquiry is better than no inquiry. No, the other, there were two other positive uh, outcomes from the meeting. Uh, we have said that consumer education is very, very deficient in the, in the area of um, financial institutions on people's savings and we were so very badly misled and uh, the victims of so much misinformation or uh, perhaps of our, uh, some of it at our own uh, for our, our own uh, yes, responsibility that we uh, we just That's were... That's the second point. You want and consumer education? Right, and he has uh, promised us this will happen for sure, that uh, presently there has been a green paper prepared which will be circulated throughout the province, and it has to do with the reforming of regulations of financial institutions, and it will be added to, to include our case. And the third thing that we got from him today... Sorry, ma'am, we must go. The third thing is quick in one sentence. Yes, the third thing we got today is his word uh, that there will never be another financial cooperative My in the province. My thanks to Alma Magali.
One firm statement from Mr. Veach today to Amar Magali is that there will never again be another housing and investment co-op under the Cooperative Act in British Columbia. Perhaps Mr. Veach, though, will put his superintendent of co-ops onto a simple, straightforward inquiry which can ease the minds of those who invested in that particular co-op, because many people have suffered from it. They're getting maybe 60 cents on the dollar, and they thought they were solidly financially sure. It's, I'll be back Monday, 5 p.m., next to News Hour.